And that's what we're talking about. Turn to 1 Kings. You want to talk about destruction? 1 Kings 10.14 Now the weight of gold that came to Solomon in one year was 603 score and 6 talents of gold. People always like to point out 666. What's the mark of the beast in the future? 666. Okay. Who was the most richest man in the world? Solomon. Nobody will ever, ever come close to the physical wealth that Solomon have. Today, everything's all computerized. It's fake. I mean, the, the cash doesn't even exist. The physical wealth doesn't even exist. I mean, we're all pushed on a fake, imaginary uh, wealth system. Okay? Be careful with that. But Solomon was the richest physical wealth man that ever lived. Okay? Six times kind of... Uh, six... Three score, six talents of gold. Verse 15. Besides that he had of the merchantmen, and of the traffic of the spice merchants, and of all the kings of Arabia, and of the governors of the country. And it goes on and talks about how, how, how much other physical wealth he had. This was a very rich man. Now I understand the Bible talks about with Solomon he had strange wives, and those strange wives turned him to other gods. But you want to know what I feel? And this, it's feel. My opinion. Not feel, but my opinion is the wrong word. When I study the issue out and you read more and more about Solomon, he had everything he could want. So one of his wives can buy, how about this experience? You don't have this. Don't you want to do this? I want to try this out. But you're not allowed to do that. Oh, but I've got all this wealth and power and everything. I become the standard. I can start deciding what I want to do and what I can't do. It's no longer thus saith the Lord. It's... I have all this power and wealth. I can decide what I want to do and what I can't do. Because you notice when Solomon first started out and started gaining all that wealth, he was still a man of God. He still honored God. What happened? After being wealthy for so long, it took its toll. That's why he started writing all those uh, proverbs about being wealthy. Be careful. He talks about vanity is a vanity. <laughs> all things are vanity. Right. Be very careful. If you can just snap your fingers and have anything you want, that's what it's talking about up there when we read up there, but the rich shall fall in temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and hurtful lusts. If you can snap your fingers and have anything you want, that's the temptation and a snare. Many foolish and hurtful lusts you fall into. When you have a lot of money, you fall into the belief that you can do whatever you want. Just like I just said with Solomon. You get to the point where you're like, I can do whatever I want. I mean, look at me. I'm the most powerful and richest man in the world. That's what happens. You stop looking at Jesus Christ and you start looking at yourself. You stop relying on Jesus Christ and you start relying on yourself and the world. Okay? Look at the famous people and the riches of the people in the world. They're a great example of this. They got all this money and they're so rich, they're miserable. So they don't have true peace. Remember we just read what contentment is. Content, when you're content, that's how you have good, true peace. These people in the world, they don't have true peace, true peace. True peace. But you see them, they're fighting over checks. Well, I, I, they offered me $2 million to do this movie. I wanted five, so I turned them down. And you look at us, we're like, $2 million. You see what I'm saying? They're nitpicking. They're fighting. They're arguing. They're not happy. Okay? They always go astray. I mean, you always listen. I, it's just, now that I'm truly saved, God has opened my eyes, but you listen to these people like uh, Sylvester Stallone talks about Jesus, and this guy, The Rock, or it's not The Rock, it's, it's blasphemous from the calm self, the capital R, Rock. That's Jesus Christ. Uh, Dwayne Johnson is his name. Talks about Christianity or Jesus. And you look at all these people. They're so satanic and wicked. They wouldn't know Jesus if he was standing right in front of them. But they're rich. And they get to do whatever they want. And they have that attitude. I do whatever I want. The laws don't always apply to us. You ever seen that one? Turn to Romans 18, 8, 13. I'm sorry. Romans 8, 13. What does the Bible say? When you start getting rich... And you start falling into temptation. 
the temptation and snare and many foolish and hurtful lusts. Notice it says hurtful lusts that we read there. Romans 8.13 says, For if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. If you are content, you're at peace, you're more liable to mortify the deeds of the body through the Spirit. When you're rich and you can have anything you want, or you have that desire, brother, sister, Christ, just a little bit more, just a little bit more, and you don't have that contentment, okay, you tend to start falling into the trap of living after the flesh. You'll start making mistakes, especially if you got a lot of money. But it can still happen on the lower scale. People will always grab this and try to teach it. It's just for people who are millionaires and billionaires. Anytime you have the attitude all the time, just a little bit more, just a little bit more, you're no different than the millionaires and billionaires that want to be rich, the people who want to be millionaires and billionaires. You're no different. You've got to learn to be content with what God has given you, food and raiment. Let's go back to 1 Timothy 6.10. What happens to these people that get rich? They start becoming fleshly. Right. They start becoming prideful. Well, I can do that. Uh, the Bible says I couldn't do that in the past. And when you were poor, you didn't dare go against the Word of God. But now that you're rich, you start going against the Word of God. I've seen that happen so many times, brothers and sisters in Christ. 1 Timothy 6.10, this is where we get into it. For the love of money is the root of all evil. The love of money. If you're content, you don't have a love of money. If you just want a little bit more, if you just want a little bit more, and then you want a little bit more after that, and then maybe just a little bit more, or maybe just a little bit more, you're just falling into the trap of the love of money. And like I said, we've talked about, oftentimes when you want to get a lot of money today, there's a cap for men in ministry, for you even as a brother and sister in Christ. There's a cap in society, in this world today, that if you want to go above that cap, you've got to compromise. The love of money. You start compromise, root of evil. Okay? This, this verse is to a man in ministry, written to Christ, for, for instruction of righteousness to Christians. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some have coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. You see that a lot in these Babel buildings. A lot of these men might have started out innocent. I just want to serve the Lord. And I, I want to preach the word and I want to lead people to Christ. And I want to encourage brethren to keep their eyes on Jesus Christ. Point at me first, if I can. Point at me. But what happens to some of those people in the Babel buildings after a while? It becomes a business. They start falling into that trap. And I need a little bit more. We, I gotta have this high. I have to live this high life. It doesn't have to be a rich life, but it's a life that's way above. It's it's way past the want. I'm sorry. I use the right words. It's way past the needs, and it's like you're living. I, the Lord told me, and I'm trying to talk too fast. Let me slow down. Ninety percent of today it used to be if you're truly poor, ninety to ninety-five percent of your life is want. There's probably maybe five percent need, or I did it backwards again. Ninety to ninety-five percent need. That's what you're living off of. That's what you have: food and clothing. That's poor. And five percent want. Maybe you get something you want once or twice a year. But as Americans, we're living in the opposite. We're living in ninety to ninety-five percent want and five percent need. We've got we got more than uh, enough clothes. We got more food than we can handle, than we need. I mean, and we got the roof over our head. Notice it doesn't even say a roof. It just says food and raiment. It doesn't even say a roof. Be content with food and raiment. We've got cars. We got this. We got that. We're living. We're not living poor, brothers and sisters in Christ. Not even close. But the love of money is the root of all evil. And when people, brethren, you fall into that, I just need a little bit more. I just need a little bit more. I just need a little bit more. What's going to happen? It's pierce themselves through with many sorrows. They err from the faith. I've seen brethren do this in some of their teachings. They try to twist scripture to justify how they want to live. They twist scripture to justify them wanting to do things that they want to do. They, what happened? They've erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. They're causing a lot of problems in their life because I believe they're truly saved. That's this is for saved. If they're not saved, they're not going to err from the faith because they were never in the faith, and it's not going to pierce them through with many sorrows because 
They're of the world. It's all about flesh, 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 flesh. This is applied to saved sinners, brothers and sisters of Christ. I believe more, most, more directed at men in ministry, but also to the brethren as a whole when it comes to instruction and righteousness. Verse 11, But thou, O man of God, flee these things and follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, and meekness. That's what you're supposed to be following after. Now I mentioned this before, but I'll mention it again. One of the biggest teachings for this study uh, is f that the lost, the, the Babel buildings do, or even saved brethren will do. They'll take these verses and say it's only applying to those that are trying to be millionaires and billionaires, gamblers. They're trying to gamble. Well, that is deceit of richness because you can't have. 10 people buy a lottery ticket and all 10 win. Let's just, I'm just using small numbers. These are large numbers, but small numbers. You have 10 people that put each put in a dollar in a ticket for a lottery for 10 bucks. If all of them won, they'd all just get a dollar back. I'm just using numbers. That doesn't include, you know, taxes and the fact that the people who are doing the lottery want their chunk of the money. I mean, that's all there too. But I'm just saying, the, the deceitfulness... And the illusion is, is that you have millions of people trying to gamble all the time thinking they're going to get rich. When only probably like 10% can actually win some money and they're never going to win. I honestly believe a lot of the times you see people who win millions of dollars, they don't exist. <laughs> hey, we're going to hire these actors to pretend that they're these people. And Hey, look, I won a million dollars. You could win a million dollars too. Deceitfulness. Just complete deceitfulness. Mm -hmm. And those, if when you look at those that are, that seem kind of genuine, that win that a lot of that money, you give them a few years, they're back to being poor again. Have you ever heard those stories? I have. They're back to being poor in a heartbeat. Okay? Why? Because the love of money is the root of all evil. If they're truly saved and born again, that'll mess up a man. I always talk to the Lord and said, it would be nice, it would be nice to own this house. To get that off my shoulders, to own this house. But I would never, I tell the Lord, I would never, Lord, want to be rich. I'm happy with what I have. Okay. okay. Talk, uh, we've talked about this real quick. I'm reading my notes. Americans today, when it comes to being rich, the average American lives rich. You go back in the past on how people had to live in the past, everybody in America lives there is no, they always say there's a poor bracket, then there's a medium bracket, and then there's the rich bracket. There's no such thing. There is no such thing as a poor bracket. We don't have a poor bracket here in America. You have people who choose to live that way. I mean, I, I won't ever work at a, don't get me wrong, I'm just for saved. I won't work at some places because I, I fear God and I won't want to promote sin. But there's jobs left and right at fast food places. There's jobs left and right at gas stations. There's jobs. The reason I won't work at a gas station, I almost did, but God put it on my heart, and I also warned a brethren about it. They sell cigarettes. They sell alcohol. I don't know if they sell alcohol at gas stations, but they might. But they sell cigarettes, and um, I think they do. But they sell stuff that promotes sin, and you don't want to be part of that. But I'm just saying, for the lost world, they've got all these jobs out there. They're there. Uh, uh, grocery stores are desperate for people. The uh, economy, there was talking about the economy, but the jobs around here, and this is a small retirement area, usually it's hard to find jobs. It's hard to find apartments and stuff like that because we're just a small area. There's signs up everywhere, help wanted, help wanted. Okay, There is no poor bracket in America. That's deception. Uh, Brother JT at uh, the Wine Press, he put out an article once um, talking about uh, meats, how there's people in other countries that they're so poor and so desperate for food that they're buying fat to feed their family. Fat. I don't know how they do it. They probably boil it up, cook it, or cook it with like a soup or something like that. But they buy fat because that's all they can afford. That, that he shows on that uh, article that the meat market over there it takes almost a full, like half a year's, half and a half years, half a month's salary to buy one little thing of steak that's good meat. It's healthy. It's not gone bad. They can't afford that. 
oh, oh, but it's like a fraction of the price if you get meat that's bad, that's gone bad. They're actually selling meat that's gone bad. I don't know how they eat that stuff over there without puking, like poison, but that there's people that are living poor, brothers and sisters in Christ. Here in America, we don't know what poor is. You and I can look in the past and say, okay, the, the Depression, people were living on the streets. They had one pair of clothing. They didn't know if they were going to eat the next day. These people that live around here, the homeless, they know they're going to eat tomorrow. They just, you know, go around, hold up signs, beg, and someone will give them some money. Some people give them free food. I know this uh, couple ladies own this uh, sandwich shop that every once in a while the, some of the homeless people will come by and they'll be nice and give them a free sandwich. Okay? But when you're actually going through hard times, businesses can't afford to do that. You know, you don't know whether you're going to eat tomorrow. We can look at that in the past, but today, it's nowhere even close. We're not living poor today at all. Once again, the illusion. Okay, we're going back to that. The illusion, if I can have a little bit more, then I'll be content. Just a little bit more, and then I'll be content. Bringing it back to that's the deceitfulness of riches that the Bible's talking about. The world blinds people and says, hey, if you have this amount, you can be happy. Or you have that amount, you can be happy. Well, if you have this amount, you can be kind of happy. But if you really want to be happy, here. But if you really want to be even more happy, here. But what the deceitfulness is, is they try to get you here first. Then they try to get you going for here. Once you get to the if you get there, then they try to get you to go to the next step. You'll never, it'll never be enough. Brothers and sisters in Christ, that's the true deceitfulness of riches. If I can have a little bit more, then I'll be content. I don't see anybody teaching this. They're always teaching it, it has to be with being rich. If you ever want to be rich someday, you want to be, if you're not content with what you have, present tense, you never will be. You have to learn to be present tense content. Proverbs 13.11 says, Wealthy gotten by vanity shall be diminished, but he that gathereth by labor shall increase. You say, what does that have to do with anything? Brothers and sisters in Christ, one of the things is that today people try to get something for nothing. And it's just a, a, the love of money out there is just so out of control. You look at the people. I spent... If you know anything about economics, you have to put in everything. You know, you make a product, you have to put in the what it costs to pay people to put the product together, the advertisement, a percentage of the advertisement goes into each product that you sell, and a percentage in everything goes in there. But bottom line, total cost, it costs me a dollar to make this product. Someone who doesn't have a lot of money is going to say, well, then I'm going to turn around and sell it for two bucks. It, they sell... Sell it for two bucks. It's, it's an item that sells. People are buying it every day. That's, I'm throwing that in there. They're buying it every day. I'm going to sell it for two bucks. You make 100% profit. But today, people are like, uh, I want I want to sell it for six bucks. I have to make a 500% profit. If I make just 100% profit, i got to shut down. I'm, just, I, I, I'm an unsuccessful business. Yeah. That's how messed up our economy is. The deceitfulness of uh, riches, but the love of money. If they're not making 500, 600% profit, they're not a good business. That's the love of money. All right. But the point is, is when you're physically working and you earn something, you feel a lot better and you will live a better life than those Wealthy gotten by vanity shall diminish. What does that mean by that? When you go through hard times, these people that have to actually... I can't work. You mean actually having to work for my... I, uh, YouTube. I know it sounds like I'm babbling a little bit because I'm just appalled by... When I did the study and you start looking at everything. YouTube, you got people sitting there playing video games and getting paid to play video games and people are watching them. A girl, uh, what was it, four... Maybe this is a lot longer. I've been here five years now. It's been five years. Um, since I've been here, but it was like seven years ago, eight years ago, uh, the highest paying person on YouTube was a woman who sat there and basically just talked about Barbie dolls. 
and accessories and different types of Barbie dolls, going back to the old dolls, to the newest doll, and she was making millions of dollars. What happens when the internet shuts down, <laughs> you know? <laughs> what do I do now? I have no clue what to do. Exactly. Okay. When you work hard for your money every day, and it's physical work, okay, but the gatherer by labor shall increase. You're doing physical work to provide for your home. That's the best way to go. I, the Lord's blessed me with a garden. I'm always pointing brothers and sisters in Christ. doesn't matter where you are. If you've got an apartment and you've got a little bit of a balcony, try to set up the balcony and just grow a little bit of vegetables. Just a little bit. Just be used to knowing how to do it. So if times get bad and you get pushed out somewhere where you can have a bigger garden, you know, you know how to do it. You know how to grow food. Okay. I always try to push that. But doing physical work, labor, gathering... Right. Let's talk about them going out to gather. If you look at the Old Testament, not to go off on a tangent again, but you look at the Old Testament, they had laws for the, the farmer would go through and they would do their harvest, but there was something where they'd leave certain pieces behind. So there'd be a little bit of food left behind so the poor could come and get that food. And you've got people, wealth gotten by vanity, you have people, I'll just pay for it. I'll just pay for it. And when they run out of money, they're like, what do I do? Whereas the poor people that go out and gather that stuff, they're working. They know how to gather. I'm above gathering. I'm above getting my hands dirty. You got those people. Okay. But it says, wealth gotten by vanity. Vanity, Webster's 1820 Dictionary. Trifling labor that produces no good. That's why I mentioned the videos. And it really doesn't produce any good. It doesn't do anything. Most of the market, uh, the, bit, the jobs and market, the way people are making money, well, with the government giving all these, paying people to stay at home and do nothing, there's that. But before that happened, a lot of the jobs, the so-called money makers and everything, aren't doing anything. They're not providing clothes on people's backs as far as making the clothes, the food, stuff for the homes to put roofs over your head, to work the land, the property. I think we're down to 4% of agriculture in America. Four percent of the land in America is being used for agriculture and farming. It used to be 80 to 90 percent 100, 150 years ago. Now it's down to four percent. Okay, someone can correct me on those numbers, but it's still close to that and it's outrageous. Most of uh, the jobs and everything, hey, you can do this, you can do that. It's vanity. Okay, trifling labor that produces no good. It's the definition number three for vanity. It doesn't do any good for anybody. Those videos online, I understand you have Bible believers doing uh, preaching the word online. You can donate to these guys so they can continue to preach the word. Now that's some hard for some people, but they're continue to preach the word. That's the whole point of donating. It's so you don't have any cares of this world. You're not falling into the deceitfulness of riches. And everybody struggles with the lust of other things. But those first two, you're not having to worry about that, so you can focus 100% on the ministry. But there's a lot of things out there. You know, you have video, people play video games for a living and go to contests and win money and stuff. It doesn't do anything. It's trifling labor that produces no good. Movies, TV shows, satanic style music, on and on and on. You, the, the American dream to be famous. That whole job system doesn't do nothing for America. Nothing. Farmers, that does something for America. People with livestock, uh, people growing uh, cotton to make clothes. Okay, it's cheap to make wool, you know, to make wool stuff. That provides for America. But they've pretty much destroyed all those industries, and now all the so-called industries of today are superficial. They don't do anything for America. Ecclesiastes um, 1 2 says, Vanity of vanities, saith the preacher. Vanities of vanities, all is vanity. And what it's talking about there, vanity, dis, the definition of vanity is emptiness, want of substance to satisfy desire, uncertainty, insanity. 
or in anity, if I can sound, say the name right. But notice it says, want of substance to satisfy desire. It's vanity. Paul says, all is vanity, vanities. Why? None of this stuff can make you happy. If you're not content with what you have, no matter how much you try to go for, you'll never be content. I've got this small place, but we're planning on big in a, building a bigger place back in here. That's not being content. If God blesses you, that place is falling apart. If it's a perfectly good place, live there. But if it's falling apart and you're praying, Lord, to help to either repair it or build another place, and the Lord allows that to happen, praise the Lord. But I'm talking about, you have a place, I have a place here. My thing is, I wanted to, this is a want. I sometimes wish I had a smaller place. It's just me. I don't need three bedrooms. This was an old, it's uh, 35, almost 40 years old, um, manufactured home. And uh, it was what I could afford. Well, technically couldn't afford. I got a loan on it, but it's the loan that I could afford to get on it. Okay. And it was I wasn't going for the max loan. I mean, I probably could have gotten a house way more expensive than this. But the point is, is it's it's I'm content with this place. I tend to want something smaller because I don't live in all these rooms. I don't need all these rooms. Sometimes I sit here in, my, in this master bedroom and say, Lord, I could live in this room. Put a little corner kitchen over here little wood stove going in this corner over here, I can live in this room. I have my bathroom right there. That's it. You know, I could be content. But with people, it's like, I got to have more. I got to have more. That little house there, you know, I got to have a bigger house. The car I've got, it's nice, but I kind of want a bigger car and bigger and bigger. And what it is, is when it talks about vanities of vanities, it's one of substance to satisfy desire. A lot of the stuff that's out there in the world today, it's addiction. And it's the deception that you can be happy. You can have more, you can be happy. Just give me a little bit more of that stuff and I can be happy. What happens when the stuff stops? I gotta have more. I gotta have more. <laughs> Movies, TV shows, video games, secular music. Uh, people today now are getting into debating as a sport. Okay, you got other, the other sports and everything, okay? But it's want, vanity is want of substance to satisfy desires and it's uncertainty. You're never going to get satisfied by that stuff. You want it to be satisfied, but it's not. It's the same thing when I fall back into temptation and choose to sin and start falling back into games. I'm miserable. I'm not happy. I'm miserable. I keep saying, well, when I was lost, I was happy. But now that I'm saved, I'm miserable. Just completely and utterly miserable. Why? Because it's vanity of vanities. It's worthless. Okay. It's trifling labor that produces no good. you got to get away from that stuff that's doing that. Um, the best preachers, get back to this study again, the best preachers that you'll ever come across is the poor ones. Absolutely. Those are the best preachers you're going to come across. When I came across King James Video Ministries, Brother Brian, he was poor. Okay, he had just, I think he was getting married, or he just got married when I got introduced to King James Video Ministries. But I remember him talking about him and his wife in his videos, so please understand, it's not gossip. He said in his videos where they talked about, and I can't remember, and if he ever watches any of these videos, he can correct me. Um, I can't remember if they said they went weeks, like a week, or weeks, plural, without meat. Okay, they were poor. He got a lot of work done for the Lord when he was poor. Now, I believe he's getting a little distracted because he's got more nowadays and it's distracting him. Big time. Okay? But you look at people when they're poor. John the Baptist can't get poor than that. He's living off of honey, one set of clothes, uh, honey, and locusts. And part of me, when I was thinking that, I was like, Lord, I wonder if there's something to that kind of a diet, you know? Because he's living off honey and wild locusts. And look at him. Either, and I believe God, I easily believe God could keep him healthy, don't get me wrong. But maybe there's some diet, like that, those two things give you almost everything the body needs. There's some, uh, not to go on a side note again, but there's some, it's called minor salad. There's some greens that grow around here that you can forage for. And it's called minor salad, and it has almost all the minerals and vitamins that the body needs. 
There used to be people that would have to forage and live off that stuff. Okay, you'll be surprised that there are certain foods out there that have a lot of stuff in it that the body needs. You don't have to have 50 million different foods. I got my C, vitamin C food here and my vitamin B. You know what I'm saying? There's stuff that has a lot of the vitamins already in it. But the best preachers are the poor ones. I'm sorry, when they're poor, that's when they preach the best. When they start getting a crowd, when they start getting money and wealth, they're not as, they can still be fruitful. Please understand what I'm saying. But they won't be as fruitful. This won't be as fruitful in their life as when they were poor. I've noticed this with ministries. They start out way up here hardcore when you're young. You're so excited about serving the Lord. And as time goes by, things happen. You get zapped into a Babel building. And the, fruit, the, fruit, the work that you're doing for the Lord starts coming down. Or you get married. Have kids. You start buying property for your kids and, and wife and everything. And now this is the work you're doing for the Lord. When it used to be up here when you were single and poor. We talked about this before. Okay? There's nothing wrong with the man in ministry getting married. But the hardest thing is, is making sure that that ministry still comes first. What happens? The ministry work starts coming down. Why? Cares of this world. You have a wife. Cares of this world. You have children. Cares of this world. You have multiple properties. Cares of this world. Multiple vehicles. Cares of this world. If you're in these Babel buildings, well, I got this Babel building I got to take care of, and now I've got to conform to a certain standard, the world standard, the government standard. All this stuff starts tearing you down as a Christian, a man in ministry. Okay? The best preachers, I'm sorry, the best preachers are the ones that have been poor. Why? Because their eyes are on Jesus and there's nothing getting in the way that's preventing this book from being fruitful in their life as a preacher. The same thing goes for Christians as a whole, brothers and sisters of Christ, in your life. The most godly, godliest men and women have been the poor ones. Even down through history, you look at it. The most godly, Bible-believing, God-fearing men and women have always been the poor ones. When you start getting money and you start living a higher standard, like a higher wealth of living, this isn't as fruitful as it used to be when you were poor. Okay? 1 Samuel 2.7 The Lord maketh poor and maketh rich. He bringeth low and lifteth up. He raises up the poor out of the dust and lifteth up the beggar from the dunghill to set them among princes and to make them inherit the throne of glory for the pillars of the earth are the Lord's and he hath set up the world upon them. For today, when I read this passage, the reason I read it is because for today, brothers and sisters Christ, there's going to come a day where the Lord's going to lift us up. He's going to lift us up out of here. <laughs> He's going to lift us up. Okay, he's going to redeem this body, this wicked body, and he's going to get us away from this wicked world. Okay, all the temptations. Okay, he's going to lift us up. And notice it says princes. The Bible talks about in Revelation, that, uh, not Revelation, but talks about those that suffer with him shall also reign with him. Okay, he called King David his captain. We're going to be captains. We're going to be princes. We're going to rule and reign with Jesus Christ. God will let the lost world have their he heaven on earth. Remember that, brothers of Christ. Oh, they're getting away with it. No, they're not. God will allow them to have their heaven on earth while with Christians he will chase him because the attitude, I need more, then I'll be content, will and oftentimes wreck your walk with the Lord. God will chase a Christian and get him back on the right track. But remember, when it comes to the world, God's the one who sets people up and tears people down. The world wants their heaven on earth. God's going to say you can have it. You want your best life now? <laughs> you can have it. Because what's waiting for them? An eternity in hell. And then tossed in the, in the lake of fire. Death and hell is cast in the lake of fire. And whosoever was not written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. That's what their eternity is going to be. Because they wanted their best life now. God's the one who sets the poor up. God sets the uh, rich up. He picks poor people. More than any time, he'll pick poor people to preach the word of God. He'll raise men up that'll be strong men of the faith that are poor. 
And what always seems to happen when you read history, he raised them up, they start preaching, they do an amazing job for the Lord, they're great men of God, but then as they start getting higher up, they get people that worship them, they start falling into the trap of the praise, they want the praise of men over the praise of God. Wealth, which we're talking about today, they get wealthier and they start to forget what it was like being poor. They forget who they were, the drive, the going 100% at Jesus Christ, doing anything and everything they possibly can for Jesus Christ. They forgot about that. They start slowing down. It happens so much. Okay? Especially if you get in the Babel building system. You get spoiled by philosophy and vain deceit. After the traditions of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. They stop going after Christ as hardcore as they used to. They fall into the Babel building system. Uh -huh. 2 Timothy 2.7 This is Paul again, talking to Timothy. Paul is a man in ministry, talking to Timothy, a young man in ministry. 2 Timothy 2.7 Consider what I say, and the Lord give thee understanding in all things. Remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead according to my gospel, wherein I suffered trouble as an evildoer, even unto bonds. When he's talking about evildoer, he's talking about how the world treated him. Okay? But the word of God is not bound. Therefore I endure all things for the elect's sake, and that they may also obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. It is a faithful saying, for if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. Now I had to underline that. We're going to get into this, but two things. I endure all things. Remember Paul was saying earlier, whatever state that I'm in, I've learned to be content. When he says I've learned to endure all things, there was a lot of times his state was a bad state. I'm talking about physically. He was beaten. He was stoned to death. Some people say he died they carried him out, threw him out there, and then God raised him up and says, I'm not done with you yet, get back to work. And he talks about the man that got caught up into heaven. Whether in the body, I cannot tell. Whether out of the body, I cannot tell. But he's had to endure all things, and he's got to learn. He's like, I had to be content with whatever state that I am for me to be able to serve the Lord completely and fully. You have to be content with whatever state you are. Okay. The other part here talks about, for if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. I had to underline this because it goes back to new creature in Christ Jesus. I did that study about 1 Corinthians 15, chapter 15, 1 through 4, when it talks about believing in vain. What does it really mean? Read the whole chapter. You have people who believe in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ with their words. It's in their head. And you read the chapter, then Paul goes, but you guys don't believe in the resurrection. You're denying the resurrection. That, that doesn't make sense. They believe in the resurrection. They profess to believe in the resurrection. But when you start reading it, and you start comparing Scripture with Scripture, Paul's saying the life that you're living is not the new man. The old man is not dead and buried with Jesus Christ. There's no new birth. Where's the new man at? You're denying the resurrection with the life that you're living. And I had all these uh, faith alone, easy believers and people attack me because they don't want the new woman. They don't want the new man. They love their sin. They love living the way they do. But here's another passage. It is faithful saying, if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. Now this could be talking about death like martyrs. But once again, it's also instruction of righteousness. You have, the old man has to die. The old man has to be dead and buried. And you have to live with Jesus Christ as a new man. Okay, You live with Jesus Christ and you live for him every day. Back to 1 Timothy 2.12. Okay. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. Here it is. You're going to suffer. In this world today, it's not like it was in the past where you can have some stuff and not have to compromise. In these last days, in order to have lots of money and lots of wealth, lots of land and this and that, oftentimes you have to compromise. Okay, Sometimes you're just going to have to live and be content with food and raiment. Mainly, if you, for brethren in ministry, if you want to actually be used of the Lord 100% and not let anything get in the way, you've got to be content with food and raiment. 
If we deny him, he also will deny us. A lot of people teach, well, that doesn't mean anything. I've already taught this, brother and sister Christ. What's it talking about here? I actually believe what it says. And I'm not going to add to it. If we deny him, he also will deny us. Okay, you have all these false converts that they're actually denying the real Jesus of Scripture. Jesus is going to deny him. He's going to separate the uh, goats in sheep's clothing from the sheep. <laughs> you know, today it's kind of might be hard to tell the difference, but he will. If we believe not, he is abide. He ab yet he abide faithful. He cannot deny himself. And we're not going into this. I've already done this on another study where we talk about this whole passage. Okay. If you deny Jesus Christ, the real Jesus Christ, he's going to deny you. That's what the passage says, and people try to change it. But what it's talking about when you keep going, it's talking about the catching away of the body of Christ. There's people that are going to try to steal your crown. They're going to try to take your eyes off Jesus Christ and the coming of Jesus Christ so that you don't live for Jesus Christ today. And one of those ways of taking your eyes off that crown is the deceitfulness of riches. I just need a little bit more. I just need a little bit more. And it gets your eyes off of Jesus Christ and on the world. If they can get you to stop looking for Jesus Christ and believing in His coming before the time of Jacob's trouble, they can steal that crown. You still believe in Jesus Christ, but you don't believe in the catching away of the body of Christ before the time of Jacob's trouble. He cannot deny himself. Whether you believe in the catching away of the body of Christ before the time of Jacob's trouble or not, if you're truly saved and born again and you're confused on the issue and we get caught up, you're going with us. He cannot deny himself. You're going with us. Okay. People who just fly out deny they know the truth, they worship a false Jesus, and they deny the catching away of the body of Christ before the time of Jacob's trouble, God's going to deny them. You won't be going with us. You will be going through that time period because you want to go through that time period, and you will. But those who get confused, they're newly saved, they're confused, or those who are hardcore on catching, um, pre-time of Jacob's trouble, catching away the body of Christ. Jesus Christ is coming before the time of Jacob's trouble, and over time they start wavering, and they start to fall away. You can't lose your salvation. But they've fallen away, they've lost that crown. And God calls us up. They're going with us. Okay? But if we suffer, we shall also reign with them. There are times where you're going to have to suffer for Jesus Christ, brothers and sisters in Christ. And one of those ways is you're going to have to be content with whatever state that you're in. And sometimes that state is not going to be a great state. You might be in prison. You might be getting punished, beaten. You get verbally abused. Okay, you have enemies. If you're truly saved and born again, you're going to have more enemies than you are friends. Okay? That's the way that this wicked world is in these last days. Okay? The brethren are so spread out and so thin. Um, there's, I have more enemies than I ever have friends in these last days. That's just the way it is. You're going to suffer for Jesus Christ. Now... This could go two different ways, but I've been trying to save up money. I remember talking to this in one of my other videos. I've been trying to save up money because a corner of my house is on the verge where it's just now starting to crumble and on the hillside, and it's getting too close to the house, and I need to do a retaining wall over here. With my back, uh, part of it's because I wasn't living right. To live by the flesh, you shall die. Um, th that's... That's just the way things are, but I had a ma major seizure disorder, and for nine years it's starting to catch up on me and my older age, and I'm, I'm slowing down, but I'm trying to keep going, but I can't work on this hillside. I just, I can't. i got to hire someone to help. If we had brethren around here that we could all, like, if it was back in the day when there was more saved, we could all come together and help one another out and do things for one another. But I'm out in the middle of nowhere when it comes to the, the body of Christ. There's, like, nobody here. So I have to pay someone to do that. So I've been saving up money for it. Now my deck needs some repair. <laughs> so that money that was supposed to be going for that, I kind of wanted to put some of it towards that. So I have this fun going. Now the pump doesn't work underneath the house for the water tank. And I'm just drawing water off the cistern. But I'm supposed to be going from the cistern to the tank and then from the tank to the house. That's the proper procedure of doing things. And I'm not doing it that way. I'm just drawing water from the cistern. So I'm like, okay, the guy comes out, well, this is all wrong, I won't fix the pump. All I want is the pump working. That's all I want. 
and this thing would all be done. But everybody I've had come out here, oh yeah, I can kind of look at it. When I get some time, I'll come back, and they never come back. I call them up, they don't answer. <laughs> and the ones that do, it's just, I'm having a nightmare with this stuff. But the point of this whole talking is, I'm sitting out there every day still content. All these things around me seem like these are, these are very important. Water is very important out here on the mountainside, out in the countryside. Not the wilderness, <laughs> the countryside. We had a, a warnings of lions, uh, cougars, I think it is. We have either mountain lions or cougars out here. I keep forgetting because I used the wrong name between the two. And, I mean, we get some wild animals out here. I've had to trap uh, raccoons, foxes. I've had a, a chicken, which we'll talk about here in a second. But the point is, I'm dealing with all this, and I'm like, oh, Lord, what do I do? You know, they want me to redo the whole system, new tank, new pump, new... And this is going to be, like, close to four or $5,000. And all I want is that pump that's brand new underneath, that's set in there for, like, a year and a half now, not working. The deck needs uh, needs to be um, the boards are all rotting where the screws are and everything and it's getting all squeaky. I need the whole deck redone, and I can kind of do that myself, but still <laughs> pushing those nails. I don't have the strength. If you've ever had a seizure disorder, I've known people that had a seizure disorder that's really bad and it took a long time to get under control. I don't have the strength that people have. I'm sitting there trying to push it. My brother was laughing at me when he came and helped me build a little bit of an awning over half the deck so I can have some shade. Um, he was laughing at me because I'm sitting there and I'm putting my whole weight and I'm pushing down as hard as I can trying to push those screws all the way into the deck when we replaced some of the boards. And this was five years ago. Um, he's laughing. He's like, man, you're so weak. Because I used to go to the gym and I was military. I was pumped. But you go through a seizure disorder, it tears up your muscles. But I'm looking at all that stuff, and the next thing I know, I'm driving the rope, uh, my truck down to, um, it's a big red barn place, but you can buy stuff for countryside stuff, for like farms and animals. And that's where I get my seed for the uh, um, food for the chickens. And you can get stuff for the garden and stuff. And I'm driving down there, and a rocket skipped across the road. Not, I had no, rock, no vehicle in front of me. Somehow it skipped across the road from these huge trucks coming this way. And it just chipped the windshield at the very bottom, in the center almost. And I'm like, oh, Lord. At first I thought nothing happened. I was like, oh, thank you, Lord, nothing happened. And I could see something, but I didn't know what it was. I thought maybe it was just junk, because I get a lot of junk from around here that uh, fall on the truck. But then once I start driving a little while, you start seeing a crack. Start going off this way. Cracks start going off this way. So I had two cracks. So I was like, oh, Lord. Well, the way that happened, that was just, that was not a coincidence. God wanted it to happen, so I was like, okay, Lord, we'll try to look into getting this replaced when we can get the budget going, uh, let's see if we can budget to get this windshield replaced. And I park it outside, because I had to go help a brother in Christ for three days, is my uncle, and uh, drove into Medford and back, and it made the crack go more than I drove it, the more the cracks went this way, but it actually chipped the bottom part where the rock hit, Stuff goes like this, and I'm like, okay, I can still live with it like that for a while because I can see through the windshield and everything. And so I park it, and evidently it got part. I parked it in the sun, and I forgot to put the. Uh, I don't know if that would have made a difference, but you know the little shade thing that you can put in the front windshield. Um, well, a crack formed and went straight up the center. <laughs> so it's like three cracks this way, right up the center, and it went all the way to the top and everything. And it's like. Okay, so I call call around, you know, it's going to be this expensive, it's going to be that expensive. And then someone, I mean, I understand insurance is a scam, but we pay insurance. So someone said, why don't you talk to your insurance company? And I was like, well, I have a deductible because I just, you know, I pay the insurance because it's what the law requires. I don't rely on insurance. If God says, hey, here's the money, here's the money. Um, but I called the insurance company, the insurance company says, yeah, you have to pay $200, we'll pay the rest. Praise the Lord. Then I've called one place. Oh yeah, it's, you have to go out of the, t like I couldn't find any place in the city. It's like, in Brookings, you have to go out of town and everything to get this windshield done. Then we have to keep the car overnight in Crescent City for us to do it. And I'm sitting there going, how am I supposed to get the car out there and get back home and let him have my car for overnight? It's just all this stress. And the Lord's like, be patient. One of the neighbors, I was talking to one of the neighbors, and he's like, here's this car from this guy here who does... Uh, windshield to even comes to your house and does it. Now, 
he doesn't come to the houses anymore because that's how old that card was that he gave me. But the guy was still in business. I started talking to the guy. 200 bucks, brand new windshield in town, and uh, there's a place in town. He moved to a place in town. And he said, yeah, for some reason when you try to look me up on Google, it doesn't show that I'm here. That's of the Lord, brothers and sisters in Christ. I'm content with what I have. And when the Lord blesses you and says, hey, I found a way for you to get your windshield replaced for 200 bucks. You can afford 200 bucks. It'll set you back a little bit and you just got to keep being content. But I can, uh, it'll, it'll get you the new windshield. And I was like, praise the Lord. Okay. Chickens. While I was gone for those three days, getting back to the chickens, when I was gone for three days, I'm pointing over here because this is the side of the house where the chickens are, um, something came in and killed one of my chickens in this back area that's all fenced in. And what happened was I found out the foxes and some of the raccoons, if your gate, if the fencing has a, a big enough hole, even if it has the little holes, what they'll do is they'll make a hole a little bit bigger and they'll sit there and they'll play and try to like scratch the ground or throw some things down. They're smart. And what they do is they try to attract the chickens over and they track the chickens over and they come over and start pecking the ground and they look over there and they reach in and grab their neck and just snap their neck and yank that whole chicken, yank the chicken right through the fence. <laughs> There's feathers everywhere. Um, so I lost one chicken a week a few weeks ago that ran off the hillside and never came back. And I just lost him and I was like, I'm down two chickens. And then the windshield happened. I was like, oh, Lord, what do we do? I trust the Lord. He knows what he's doing. What happens, happens. And I get a call from one of the neighbors saying, hey, some person I know of, he's selling, they got four hens, egg-laying hens, and they're going to sell some of them. And I'm like, I've got some babies, but these babies, the eight that I've got, I think two or three of them are roosters that they're not going to last because I only need one rooster. Um... But that's going to be another like four or five months before they start laying eggs. And I'm losing my egg laying hens that are already laying eggs. And I'm like, that's such a blessing. I'll take two. I got a black one. I lost a black one. I got a, uh, the other one that's like tan. I forgot the, the brand. Uh, the, the brand. Um, not brand, but the uh, species. But it was exactly like the one I, I, I lost that that creature came in and, and took her away and you know, left feathers everywhere. I was like, Lord, this is not a coincidence. This is a blessing. But when that stuff happens, you need to make sure that you're content. The windshield breaks. The deck's getting old and falling apart. I need the a retaining wall. I got the water system I'm trying to fix. The tank, the cistern tank, has, has a layer of mud in there. I've got to get that cleaned out during the winter. Have someone come and that has the pump and the equipment to they have to muddy up the water as much as possible and then they've got to suck all that out of the out of the cistern but you want to do that during the rain I mean that's stuff I gotta get done but the Lord's teaching me you gotta be content with whatever state that you're in and keep praising the Lord and keep your eyes on Jesus Christ all right Philippians 4 11 now that I speak in respect of want for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith be content. That's what the Lord taught me. Be content, be content. And when all that stuff happened, it also brought to mind that uh, Bible verse. Let's see if I put it down here. Yeah, Romans 8:28. All this stuff's happening, but uh, no matter how much things seem to be falling apart in your life, brothers, this is a Christ. The little things that happen like that with the chickens, with the uh, the the windshield pointing out to the truck. The windshield, Romans 8, 28. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God. Remember what we talked about? What's loving God? You're doing everything you can to keep His Word. That's what loving God is. It's not this flesh feeling that you get in these Babel buildings. True love for Jesus Christ is you're doing your best to live according to His Word. Okay? All things work together for good to them that love God, to them that are called according to His purpose. Okay? And it just, it just hit home really good. And the Lord, with this teaching, is trying to go through this study. It's like, Lord, yeah, I'm, I'm learning to be content. Thank you, Lord. There's all this stuff I want fixed, I want clean. But God's like, right now in your present state, I've got water from the cistern. 
I want this done. I'm going to still keep making calls every so often, trying to see about somebody who will come and fix this tank. But I've failed. It just, it just seems like every plumber in this, in this city is mentally ill or something. Because they come out, oh yes, I can fix it. I'll call you with an appointment to come take a look at it. To actually come and fix it. And then they disappear. <laughs> and then you had one guy come look at it. Well, I could fix it, but I'm not going to. I'm like, are you mentally insane or something? It's a job. Get the pump working. That's what I'm paying you to do. Well, I think you need to do the newer system. And you get the new system built up. And it's like, oh, just insanity in America today. You know, like I said, there's no such thing as poor. If these guys were poor, it's a job. <laughs> I'll fix it. I'll get the pump running. It won't be as efficient as the new systems that they're doing today, but I can get it up and running the way it was working just fine for 30 years, and we'll get it going again. That's poor. They need the money. They need the job. Okay? We don't know what poor is. Mm -hmm. Now, going back to what I said, in order to uh, follow Jesus today with no compromise, you'll have to suffer for Jesus Christ. Times are going to get tough. Times could get tough. And they probably will. Okay? You can't compromise. Some brethren are getting distracted by cares of this world, and they're starting to compromise. They're starting to fall into the deceitfulness of riches, cares of this world. Deceitfulness of riches. I just need a little bit more. Just a little bit more. Just a little bit more. Come on, just give me just a little bit more, and then I'll be content. Just a little bit more, Lord. Okay, you gave me that, but I just need a little bit more, then I'll be content. Okay, I'm content, honest, I'm content. And then they see something over here. Well, maybe. See what I'm saying? It's really affecting people. I see it with the brethren as a whole, but I've also seen it with men in ministry lately. Great men of God that have been so great in the ministry and done so much work for the Lord, they're starting to dwindle and they're starting to drop off. Okay? Revelation chapter 3, verse 15. One, a couple more verses and we're done. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would that were cold or hot. So then because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Because thou sayest, I am rich. One thing that we forget, brother, sister, Christ, is we get so focused on what this world is. Remember what we just read earlier about something that's temporary. Earthly. Okay? We're not thinking of the eternal things. We're thinking of temporary things. And we get too distracted with temporary things. Say, I am, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. Notice it didn't say want of nothing. Need. Your needs are taken care of and then some. Okay, Your needs are taken care of. Have need of nothing and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked. I counsel thee to buy me of gold tried in the fire, that thou mayst be rich, and right raiment, that thou mayst be clothed, and that thou, the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. And anoint thine eyes with eye salve, that thou mayest see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. The whole point of this study, brother, says Christ, I hope I've driven it home. You need to be content with whatever state that you are in. You need to be content. Okay? That way you can serve the Lord and start worrying more about the Bible, living the Bible, and the judgment seat of Christ. You can start focusing on your own salvation with fear and trembling. Turn to 1 Corinthians 3.11. Notice he says, Cancel thee by of me gold tried in the fire. What's this gold tried in the fire? 1 Corinthians 3.11 For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Christ Jesus. If they deny me, I'll deny them. Why? Because the foundation they're laying is not Jesus Christ of the King James Bible, the real Jesus Christ. It's an antichrist. Okay. Which is Jesus Christ. Now if any man build upon this foundation, once you have the foundation, the real Jesus Christ, if any man build on this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, and stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire. And the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. You have the crowns of reward. 
We have the uh, ruling and reigning with Jesus, Jesus Christ. Okay. 15. If any, if any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet as so by fire. Remember we read over there, if they believe not, he can't deny himself. Catch away the body of Christ. I believe when you read the whole chapter, the context. But the whole point is you can have a Christian that gets saved and gets really messed up to the point where God just says, fine, kills you, brings you home early. And you miss out on so many rewards. Okay. Anything that gets burnt up, it's he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so is by fire. First salvation, eternal salvation. You're saved. You're not going to hell. You can make a wreck of your life as a Christian and you're not going to hell. Don't use that as an excuse to wreck your life. Well, if I'm not going to hell, I can live however I want. That's no excuse. Paul says, am I supposed to sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How are we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Okay, that's not how we're supposed to live. But you can make a wreck of your life. It's not too late to turn it back around. Brothers in ministry out there that realize that they can claim they're putting the ministry first as, as much as they want. You realize, I look back and I'm not working as hard for the Lord as I once did. I'm getting so distracted by the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches. Just a little bit more, then I'll be happy. Just a little bit more, then I'll be at peace. Why am I saying it that way? Because that's what content is. Well, you're at peace. Of what, whatever state that you're in, God gives you peace. I'm at peace. I'm happy with it. I'm content. Right. Uh, just to finish this up, I believe that some of the wood, hay, stubble is times in your times in your life where you fell for deceitness of riches. Cares of this world. You get distracted by cares of this world and you get to doing all this work that's not glorifying God. God's like, I want you over here. But you say, I'm going over here. That's going to become wood, hay, and stubble when you go over here, when God's saying, go here. You fall into the cares of this world. You fall into the deceitfulness of riches. Just a little bit more, and I can be happy. Just a little bit more, and I can be happy. Brothers and sisters in Christ, this matters a little bit, but this here, present tense, our being here on earth, is not as important as the future. That judgment seat of Christ is important. We're supposed to be living a life of Christ today. Don't let deceitfulness of riches get in your way of serving the Lord with the life that you're living. There's nothing wrong with building a garden. There's nothing wrong with having some things. But like Paul said, he, they were coming in with all of a sudden just like a surge of donations. And he was probably having to live poor. You know, I might eat once a day, every other day. And all of a sudden, boom, this big thing of... Praise the Lord. But just so you know, it's not about a want, you know, because I've learned to live, be content in whatever state that I'm at, I am. Whatever the Lord provides, I am grateful for. You give God glory in all things, you give Him thanks in all things. But be content. Okay? Don't let the deceitfulness of riches ruin your walk with the Lord, because it will. Some people, most of them I turned out to be false converts, but... You know, they're just not, they're not content. They're just not content. And they don't have the peace that you and I have, brothers and sisters of Christ, but one of the ways you lose your peace is because you're not content. Remember to be content. Right? I hope this study has helped you. I'm sorry that it went this long, but I love the Word of God and I love preaching, and I hope this helped me to say, hey, be content. God will help you take care of things as time goes on. Something will happen. I, I know God will open doors to get this stuff set up and get this stuff fixed. I trust the Lord. And I can't just sit on my butt, I understand that, but I'm trying, but the doors are just being slammed right in my face. God will open the doors when the doors open. So, just remember that. Be content. Don't let the deceitfulness of riches make this book, the Word of God, unfruitful in your life. Okay? Remember, you can go through... Um, Proverbs and learn about riches. You know, a lot of the problems with being rich. Paul talk, uh, Solomon wrote uh, Proverbs, talks about the problems about being rich. Okay, a rich man shall fall <laughs> into a snare.
Okay, rich man this, you know, you've got to be careful. So grace and peace from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. And my love for you which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Thank you for watching.